spent most of my career working in an industry that's completely changed the world that we live in. Most of it's happened in anonymous buildings like this behind very firmly closed doors. Ten years ago, I became involved in a BBC project that aimed to throw open those doors so everybody could take part in that revolution. What happened in rooms like this used to be a complete mystery. For this is where the computer lived. It sent out gas bills, it did our payroll, it helped to run companies, and it affected everybody's lives. But ordinary men and women simply didn't come into this room. The computer room was the temple of the electronic age. And it was a temple in which the high priests of computer technology jealously guarded their secrets. In a few weeks' time, this computer will be turned off forever. And the reason why it's about to become history and the reason why our attitudes towards computers have changed so much can be found by looking at the air conditioning. For eight years, the temperature and the humidity of the air around this computer has been monitored by another computer, and this is it. It's cost a few hundred pounds, and it's the same one that's used through most of the schools throughout the country. Today, a personal computer is as commonplace as a typewriter. But 10 years ago, just getting your hands on a computer was extremely exciting, and it really didn't matter what you were using it for. But this particular computer, the BBC Micro, was designed with one purpose in mind, and that was to make Britain the most computer literate nation in the world. Computer literacy means knowing enough to get computers to work for you. For a textile designer doing her own weaving in a small workshop in Whitechapel, that means using a second-hand BBC Micro to speed up her work. Having the computer means that everything is a lot faster and efficient. We can work out all our designs on the screen and using the keyboard and eliminate a lot of wrong designs, mistakes, things we're not happy with, before we actually transfer all that information into the loom and actually start weaving. It's a very user-friendly programme. I couldn't dream of programming it myself, and that doesn't interest me. I just see it as a way of making my weaving quicker, more efficient, my business quicker and more efficient. The sort of complexity of designs that we need for our business, they are quite complex. It would actually take possibly a day to weave some of the more complex designs like this. Whereas this way, having the computer do all that memory process for us, we can just concentrate on the weaving and we get uh, three or four complex designs done a day. Computers have become so familiar that wherever they're used, they seem quite normal. Yet they're still not universally accepted. We're the only company that I know in, in this small workshop situation who does use the computer connected to the loom. Uh, there does seem to be some resistance. I think some people are still quite scared of computers. I suppose. A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. The first electronic computers were built of valves and miles of wire. They could do arithmetic hundreds of times faster than any human, but only a mathematician could get them to work, and only governments and large organizations could afford to own them. Who knows? Someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. Computers became increasingly important, but for most people, they remained completely alien. Well, it was something completely different to what I imagined, because I couldn't really imagine anything. I'd never heard of a computer or seen a computer or knew anything about it. When I first walked in here, it was rather bewildering because everything was so modern. Then in 1978, a television programme drew attention to a very small revolution. This is the size of a computer today, as powerful as the biggest of only a few years ago, but a thousand times cheaper. What makes it possible is this. Inside here is a silicon chip with all the important components of the computer etched onto its tiny surface. It's called a microprocessor. Under an electron microscope, magnified and slowed down, it's possible to see it at work. Electric pulses being directed by switches. 
By sending the pulses along different channels, a chip can be made to do anything from arithmetic to reading a book. Such chips will totally revolutionize our way of life. They are the reason why Japan is abandoning its shipbuilding and why our children will grow up without jobs to go to. When the microprocessor appeared, I treated it as a wondrous toy, um, a computer that I would possess and be able to change and alter myself. Some of the first computers in the world have been developed at Cambridge University. Now any student could build one. Those who did formed their own amateur society. The sorts of things we got up to in the society were, were building computers for fun. This is um, the first machine that I built, which is a, a very simple device where basically you could enter information into its memory using these switches and see the information on the lights and uh, see what the effects were. With the microprocessor group, it sort of sucked in a lot of the talent at Cambridge University and local businessmen got to hear about it and started scouting bits of the people there. I think for Roger and myself it was particularly exciting because as this was happening we got involved in the embryonic acorn and uh, our activity moved from the hobbyist into the commercial realm. New companies sprang up to supply enthusiasts who wanted to build their own machines, though selling computers as kits did have its problems. We sold the Atom in kit form and ready assembled and what finally convinced us only to sell completely built machines was receiving back one that had been glued together. Every component had been very, very carefully glued in place with plastic cement and the man who did it wondered why it didn't work. In 1980 came a watershed. Clive Sinclair produced a complete computer for less than £100. It plugged into a television and even people who knew nothing about electronics could learn to use it. The ZX80 and its successors turned the micro into the home computer and anyone could afford one. Other companies jumped on the bandwagon and Britain soon had more computers than any other country. The enthusiasm seemed insatiable. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the Hobby Computer Club. I noticed there are People wanted to learn more and to meet that need, the BBC planned a major educational project. Computers were going to be very important. They were going to affect everyone's lives. People didn't know much about them or understand very much about them. And the purpose of the whole project was to give people some understanding of what they were and what they could do. I mean, it was a period of what was called then the microelectronics revolution, wasn't it? And everyone was terribly worried about the social impact of these things. I mean, the Germans were talking about the, the job killer. They called the chip the job killer. And there were all sorts of predictions about the way it would affect the structure of employment and so on. And we were terribly worried that uh, we weren't doing enough to prepare people for social, the social changes that, that, that were being predicted. In 1982, the BBC Computer Literacy Project began with a television series. Its aim was to allow everyone to come to terms with the new technology. The early research we did showed, first of all, that there was a tremendous curiosity about computers, really on the part of everyone, not just a few specialised people, but on the part of everyone. But secondly, there was a very large degree of anxiety about them. People thought they were mysterious machines which could only be understood by very, very clever people in white coats. And we wanted to disabuse people of that idea. The programme showed ordinary people using computers, starting with an 80-year-old shopkeeper. Phyllis Arundel wanted to know more frequently than her accountant could tell her her precise financial position. She'd seen microcomputers advertised and decided that she too must have one. I mean, it looked like a typewriter, didn't it? And I could operate a typewriter, and I was fascinated by the little bits that came up on the screen in front of me, and having a printer and able to press another button, and it, it came out on the printer at the side. It was great fun. We tried to have a mixture, obviously, of showing examples of people using machines of all kinds out in, out in the real world. And we always included a little bit of sort of hands-on in each programme so that people could feel that they could get their computers and actually try these things out for themselves. We have a programme in there and we can put it into the machine. Well, let's do it. All right, so far so good. There's a perfectly ordinary domestic cassette recorder. Exactly. OK, connected to this. Now, what computer there? literacy meant encouraging people to get their own hands on a computer. So to accompany the television programmes, the BBC team made a radical decision to commission their own machine. Just tell it to run. Run. Nice simple English words, I must say. And return, I suppose. That's it. <laughs> nice multicoloured game, that. At that time, there wasn't in existence 
a computer that was really very suitable for people to learn on anyway. And the interesting thing about the BBC Micro, once we'd agreed that we would go out and have one, was that it was really a machine that was designed by the educators. We went out and we talked to all the specialists in computer education up and down the land. We asked them what they would like a computer to do, ideally, for people to learn on it. Six bidders competed for the contract to build the BBC Micro. It was won by a company in Cambridge, but building the prototype had been a race against time. My recollections of that time are um, of Herman ringing up late one Sunday evening to inform me the BBC were coming to visit Acorn the following Friday, and wouldn't it be nice if we could show them a prototype? And he said, no, there was absolutely no way this could be done. So I followed this up with a phone call to Roger and said, Stephen said, if we really tried hard, we might be able to get this done by Friday. And he said, Roger said it was completely out of the question. It couldn't be done by Friday. But if Stephen was crazy enough to try it, I'll, he, he would try it. So both of us believed that the other person was insane enough to try and make this thing work by Friday, when we both personally knew that that was completely out of the question. So we came to work on Monday and worked out what Herman had done to us and uh, carried on. Um, by Wednesday, we had a complete circuit diagram of the machine, and all of the pieces were on order. And it was then a matter of working three days and two nights to have the hardware running, I think, 7 o'clock on the Friday morning, which left Roger three hours to get some software running before the BBC arrived. And then we showed up on Friday, and they were there. They looked a bit pale, but they were there. And uh, there was the machine, and they showed it to us, and we were extremely impressed. And what we didn't realise, of course, was that uh, they'd actually made, in effect, that machine over the last three days. The original BBC Micro belongs to the first generation of personal computers. It's got a memory that will hold the equivalent of seven or eight pages of text. And for its time, it was fast, and even today, it's quite flexible. This design is more than 10 years old, and in the world of computing, that's more than a lifetime. Yet, there are thousands and thousands of these still in use today. People still visit shows dedicated to their favourite machine. For many people, that loyalty comes from their first experience. It was a little bit of science fiction, but it was in my parlour, it was in my bedroom. I could do it myself. That's what I really enjoyed about it. <laughs> I started out by borrowing the manual from school. Learned to program by the time I was nine. How many coloured squares in there? Three. Well, you make it eight. Ooh. <laughs> it's um, completely revolutionised my whole existence. I was a primary school deputy head um, until, what, 1983. Then I escaped from the classroom and uh, unintentionally got into the software business and I've never looked back. The master, master loves, loves silver. silver, yes. I actually begin to understand by putting typing programs in myself from magazines that we buy, I'm actually beginning to understand what each of the different instructions means by doing it in BBC Basic. We have a BBC B at home and we use it mainly for educational programs for the children to play around on. The micro created an industry that new companies could get into very is easily. Nazi Jessa had a small business selling electronic components to enthusiasts, but the arrival of the BBC Micro opened up a whole new market for accessories and add-ons. The BBC computer meant a lot to us. In the early days, you wouldn't believe people were queuing outside the shop because there was no space in the shop to stand. Having realised what the demand was, we immediately changed our, our business from, compu from components to computers and we developed a lot of add-on cards, add-on ROMs and we found this was the best market to be in. The excitement, the, the way people were talking about computers, I remember youngsters who would come to the shop, they would hang around in our shop for about five hours and they would continually talk about computers, nothing else. They were not talking football, they were not talking anything. It was just computers, computers, computers. Over a million BBC computers have been sold. But equally important, there have been over a hundred television programmes covering every aspect of a rapidly changing technology. I suppose the most daunting thing about computers is this business of communicating with them. There's the machine and I'm supposed to talk to it. I say talk, but it's more a matter of writing it little notes, you type little memos into it. Of course, there are a large number of what computer people call languages. 
but they don't seem much like any language we humans speak. Revolutionary ideas. This is part of British Leyland's sales promotion for the 1982 Motor Show. Everything you see, from the banks of slight projectors to the robot arm, is being controlled by a microcomputer. Well, I can best explain this difference by looking at a short program I've got here. We define a variable first equals 12, the number 12. We're going to print it, and then we're going to do a little bit of arithmetic on it. Print first plus one. There were many different approaches. Some using onboard home microcomputers, others used nothing but specially designed homemade electronics. So, what do disks offer? Well, for one thing, every disk has a built in catalogue or directory of all the programs stored on it. So, all I need to do is type in star cat, and there we are, I get a complete list of all the programs on the disk. Followed by a light snack with a choice of tea or coffee. Thank you. Now, with a portable computer, you can take your office with you literally wherever you go. And, of course, you can get on with anything that you want to do, typing letters or scripts. And the great thing about being up here is that I don't think I'm going to be interrupted by the telephone. So now, well, I just have to do all those calculations all over again and draw up a new estimate. But that's the sort of thing that a spreadsheet copes very well with. This is Lotus 123, set up to look like that example. Each time Alison presses a key, Ben copies it and gets the reward of more of the picture. Sometimes Alison has to count along the keys to get the right number, and others she can recognise right away. Finished. Welcome to Computing for the Terrified. Now, everyone knows that if you hit the wrong key on a computer, something terrible will happen. I'd like each of you to find a computer in the room, and you have five minutes to make the computer explode by pressing the wrong keys. It's a simulator. The sound effects, the pictures, the pitching and tossing of 20 tonnes of machinery and joyriders are all controlled by two very small, very ordinary computers. Those ordinary computers were now part of a business dominated by international corporations. British companies had done well in the market for home computers, but that couldn't grow forever and eventually the boom bust. In 1984, there was a total collapse of the home computer market. The initial excitement and the enthusiasm for microprocessors just, just ran out. Uh, people got maybe overexcited and, and bored uh, too much and realized uh, that um, uh, they couldn't do all those things that they thought they might be able to do with it. And, and uh, people lost interest, especially on the home computer side. I am Many of the companies selling home computers disappeared, but the BBC Micro survived. It had already found its niche in another market, and here it was to play its most important role. The government had decided to put computers into every British school. I want youngsters, boys and girls, leaving school at 16 to actually be able to operate a computer. A lot of their lives are going to depend Schools on... could choose between three British computers. Most of them chose the BBC Micro. In 1983, Anita Straker was responsible for introducing micros into primary schools. In my case, of course, the children nearly always knew that I was coming into school and I was going to have a computer with me, so they were waiting for me to get there. Nice to see you. What the children doing today? At the moment, we're working on a programme called Elm Tree Farm. Which the children were desperately interested, very excited, rushed up as soon as the machine... I mean, we had to fend them off. It was easy to program. I was an amateur programmer uh, and was interested in um, writing things that children would find exciting to use in schools, in classrooms. Um, and the user guide was easy to use, easy to look at, easy to read, easy to learn from. So that was the first thing I found out. It was going to be easy to program the BBC computer. Uh, the second thing was that uh, as soon as I started to use it, I mean, I found colour very exciting to use. I'd never had a machine that had colour on it before. I'd never seen a computer with colour on it before. So that was a real thrill. Clouds. Yeah, clouds. In primary schools, computers have helped an approach to learning that encourages children to solve problems for themselves. It made it possible for children to be 
in control of making decisions, to take that decision, to try it out and see whether it would work or not, and to do all that without any intervention from the teacher. The real difference it made was that it turned British classrooms into some of the most exciting places in the world. And it's certainly true that we here in the UK led the world, as far as education was concerned, in investigating interesting and different ways of using computers in school. For Chris Evans, the computer is now as much a part of school life as the playground. But like thousands of other teachers, she first had to learn how to use it herself. The initial training when computers first were introduced into the classroom was very limiting. It was two days, and this was just for one member of staff. This meant that that member of staff, A, had to be very committed to the idea of integrating it into the school, and B, had to be able to spend time moving around classrooms, helping other people. The work above. OK. There are obviously many ways it will enhance children's learning. It can be very useful for those children who maybe don't always achieve. A computer is very forgiving unlike maybe a piece of written work, which when you've done it, if it looks a real mess, I'm afraid it looks a real mess. Whereas a piece of word processing can be printed out and it really will make a child feel a lot of self-worth. From 10 years of using computers within the school, both children and teachers have gained such tremendous confidence in using them. It has now become a part of everyday school life. Lucy. Well yeah. used, computers make learning a much more exciting experience, as well as becoming familiar and normal themselves. Don't you? Do you want to try this, um, but in the this home, one? whatever the original intentions, computers have mostly been used to play games. And for a long time, it was mainly boys who played them. The result was that computing was often seen as a boys' subject. And in some schools, the way that computers were introduced put many girls off for good. Sometimes the first teachers in a school who got interested in using computers were men, often from a computing studies or computing or electronics or mathematics background. Um, some of them were quite fanatical about it, really enthusiastic, hogged the machine, kept it in their classroom, took it home in the boots of their cars uh, and played with it all hours of, days of the day and the night. If women teachers feel reluctant to use the machine, it inevitably will lead to girls who are reluctant to use the machine. So in schools where women teachers took initiative early on and were seen as the role models, that certainly played a part and helped. What are you going to do now? Edit channel calibration. Now, the whole school in Cambridge is a fairly typical comprehensive, but teachers here have written software that's used all over the country. Space, M1. When micros were first introduced into secondary schools, CW. it was assumed that their main role would be to help Ten. teach computing. But that's become rather less Ten. important. The idea of computer literacy has changed from learning how to program computers to knowing how to use them as effectively as possible. The original BBC Micro is still used in most British schools, but it's gradually being replaced by a new generation of computers. These are not only faster and more capable, but they're able to handle far more information, and that's affecting every subject in the curriculum. We're at a very exciting phase in the use of computers in schools. Um, if we look back over the last four to five years, we've seen tremendous changes in, in the technology, in the power of the computers and the sophistication of the software. Teachers at Netherhall have recently developed new software. Pupils can now learn for themselves about a historic battle. Sequence showing the struggle to remove corpses from the trenches. The Battle of the Somme project has taken over two years to develop. It involves graphics, text, moving images, stills, scans, okay. a database, uh, and it's all there for the pupils to explore on, on endless avenues, uh, giving them a very interesting, exciting approach to a particular piece of uh, coursework. These pupils are now learning not so much how to use computers, but rather how to handle and interpret information. And in a world full of information, that's a vital skill. <laughs> None of them seem to be shut down. The effect of the BBC Micro in a classroom has been a bit like a Trojan mouse. It's done an enormous job, but there it sits in the corner, quietly, um, at the same time. 
but the computer literacy project was designed for everyone, whatever they're calling. Philip Foster is the vicar of an inner city parish. He needs to keep track of his parishioners, write letters and keep records. Ten years ago, he'd never used a computer. His experience is typical. Seven years ago, I heard about BBC Micros and after a bit of exploration, I got one, which was very exciting. And I began to discover the things it could do. It could help me write my sermons. I'd use a typewriter, but of course this was quite different. I think there was a lot of frustration in the beginning days because I was quite illiterate. You know, you turned it on, you thought, oh, something's going to happen. And of course, nothing did until you started doing things with it. And then the excitement, I think, was a slower build than the frustration. The frustration fell away, the excitement grew. I used the BBC to publish a, a simple little broadsheet which we put through everybody's letterbox. And that actually plodded along, I think, for about four or five years. And that was just paced up photocopying, and out it went. Today, the parish publishes a glossy community magazine, printed commercially and attracts advertising. Yet all the pages are laid out and designed in the vicarage study. That's possible because modern computers and their software have become far easier to use. What I found about the Archimedes compared to the BBC, which I love and respect, is it worked so easily. With the ARC, you just press a mouse button and up comes a menu and it's telling you things. It's all in English. It's something you can read and you try it and it does it. The glorious thing it would do is to produce the whole magazine without any paste up. The thing was there on the screen, you could stick text in, it would flow into columns, it would flow around illustrations, illustrations could be dropped in. It was like suddenly stopping peddling and, and discovering that the thing just went almost on its own accord. Ten years ago, desktop publishing for a vicar in his study would have been unthinkable. But now, it's simple. In just a few years, computers have changed enormously. So what has become of the original aims of the BBC project? Ten years ago, when you switched on a computer, you wouldn't be surprised to find something like that on the screen. What you did next was completely baffling unless you'd had some form of training. The project began when computers were difficult to use. Obscure commands had to be typed in with rigid accuracy. But today, using a computer is rapidly becoming as simple as writing a letter. This is a pen computer. It's actually the first time I've ever been able to use one. And using an ordinary pen, you can actually write to it. And I can write B, B, C. And the computer will recognise that and put it in. I can put it in in lowercase, put Mac. Just like that, very simply, it recognises that. If I want help, I can just stroke on info and it will bring up help messages like that. It's really beginning to be a breakthrough in true ease of use, although we're still some time off when we can actually talk to a computer. So with all this easy to use computers, was the BBC project really worthwhile? Well, I believe it was worthwhile. I believe it was very important in that transition ten years ago when many people had a fear of computers, when they believed if they touched a keyboard and hit the wrong character, it was going to actually break the computer, to today where many people simply take the computer for granted.